Good morning. So let's move on to the session on glossaries and, and uh, terms. So this is uh, Professor Umar Rao bringing you the lectures under the e Sikshana program of uh, VTU. I'm a professor from RV College of Engineering, and uh, we are dealing with the lectures on uh, electrical power quality in your first module. So in my previous lecture, I spoke to you about the procedure to evaluate a power quality issue. So there we saw that the first step is in defining the problem. And then we have to characterize the problem. And then we have to do measurements. And then we have to come up with solutions. And each of the solution has to be evaluated for its technical feasibility. And those solutions that are not technically feasible should be discarded. And whatever we have retained, they have to be evaluated for economic cost. And then we choose the optimal solution. And uh, sometimes we may have to trade off between the technical and economic aspects. Another thing of importance there is to see whether the solution we provide is going to create another fresh problem for us. Something, something else is some other problem going to crop up. So these are all the important aspects of the evaluation of a power quality problem. The next step I told you is to agree on a common terminology. So there are standard bodies which have defined. And so in the next couple of lectures, we will be seeing this. What are the common terms? Okay. So first we will see what are the general classes of power quality problems and transients. So when I mean a class means, how do I group them? See, we discussed that there are many problems and each of the problems affect a different parameter, like some may affect the magnitude, some, some may affect the uh, wave shape and some, some may affect the uh, combination and so on. So do we divide them into different classes or do I treat them all alike? So there are some broad classifications and in this lecture we will see how the power quality problems are classified. So what are the general classes of power quality disturbances? So normally any body, whenever they want to perform such an enormous task, the first step is you form committees. These are called as coordinating committees or uh, task forces, right? So these committees have to come together, the members of the committee and do brainstorming sessions and then come up with some standards and definitions. So obviously this committee has to be made of experts. So the IEEE Standard Coordinating Committee 22 has led the main effort in the United States to coordinate power quality standards. And in Europe, SIGRE and IEC are the two bodies which develop the standards. So now let us see what are all the various classes that cause electromagnetic disturbances. And this classification was given by IEC. As I said, it's a European organization. So the classes have been divided. So in each class, there are a number of uh, power quality issues. And we will just see how the classification has been done. We'll not go into detailed definitions of this that will follow. Okay, that will that will follow. So the first one is conducted low frequency phenomenon. So for electromagnetic environment, we have conduction. That means where there is a direct contact. There's a direct contact. And we have radiation where there is no contact. 
So the electromagnetic phenomenon is radiated through a medium without contact between the source and the recipient, without contact between the source and the recipient. That, that is called as radiation. This is conduction. Conduction means which can travel through the conducting medium, through the conduct. There's a medium there, which is basically the conductor. So conducted low frequency phenomenon, low frequency here is your power frequency that is 50 hertz or 60 hertz. So what are all the physical principal phenomenon which fall under these? First is harmonics. So the lowest frequency in a spectrum is called as the fundamental frequency. And for the power signals, it is either 50 hertz or 60 hertz. That's called as a fundamental frequency. So in India, it is 50 hertz. Harmonics are all integer multiplicants. So second harmonic will be 100 hertz. Third harmonic will be 150 hertz. Fourth harmonic will be 200 hertz and so on. So any harmonic of the order H, the frequency will be H into 50 so 20th harmonic will have 20 to 50,000 hertz. And there are a number of reasons why these harmonics arise, which you will uh, deal with possibly in your third unit on harmonics. And so now we know what is harmonics. Then we have interharmonics. Interharmonics, they fall in the non-integer multiple of the fundamental. Non-integer multiple of the fundamental. So these are all low frequency in the sense you have high frequency where, you know, the oscillations may be very high in kilohertz. These are all normally in hertz, even the harmonics. Because very high harmonics are not of interest to us because their magnitude will be very low. And so all these will be maybe within 1000 hertz. So 1000 hertz, you know, in a 50 hertz scale, it is 20th harmonic. And normally our harmonics are of lesser interest. So they all belong to the class of conducted low frequency phenomenon and interharmonics would be somewhere in between 75 hertz so 75 hertz on a 50 hertz fundamental is 1.5 times so that's not an integer so such harmonics are called as interharmonics then signal systems we send some communication signals for some coding for some uh, understanding to send a message through the power lines. They're called as power line carriers. Okay. So it is called as power line carrier communication, PLCC. Next, we have voltage fluctuations. Voltage fluctuation is uh, one term and flicker also means the same. So this is a rapid change in the voltage around the nominal. It won't be a huge increase and decrease. Around the nominal, there will be a rapid variation. So this, as I have discussed earlier, is typically due to uh, welding equipment. They cause uh, flicker. And this flicker is perceptible in the vision. So you find your eye is able to detect it. Then we have voltage dip. Dip is used by IEC and IEEE uses the word SAG. Both mean the same, come down. So a dip is coming down from the nominal value. An interruption where the voltage is close to zero. Then voltage imbalance or unbalance, both words are used, where all the three faces do not have the same voltage. This could be because of faults. Primarily, it's because of faults. Then power frequency variation. That is a fundamental frequency variation. It won't be 50 hertz all the time. It may be 49.9, 49.8, and it may go up to 50.05 and so on. So the frequency maintenance depends on the matching of the active, active power generation and demand. That is the active power generated must be equal to the demand. Then the system will operate at a nominal frequency, which in India is 50 hertz. If the demand is more than the generation, 
if the demand is more than the generation, the frequency will reduce. It will operate below 50 hertz. If the demand is less than the generation, the frequency will go up above the nominal. Okay? So, continuously the demand and supply has to be matched. The supply has to match the demand. Supply is under your control. Demand is not under your control. Demand is under the control of the consumer. The customer may switch on the load, switch off the load. There may be load rejection. There may be overloading. So continuously, the frequency has to be sensed. And in all your conventional generation, like thermal, hydel, nuclear, these are sensed. And the deviation of the frequency from the nominal is sent as a signal to the governor of the turbine. And the turbine governor will suitably adjust the power output of the turbine to match the supply because the power output from the turbine is input to the generator, right? So the generator output is the load. So the input and output have to be matched. So this is called as a load frequency control. And I'm sure all of you have studied it in your power systems course. So the power frequency variations arising due to the variation in the load is another low frequency phenomenon. And some induced low frequency voltages could be because of interactions, magnetic interactions. And you may have some DC component in AC networks. We'll later on see what is the problem with this DC and why it comes. Okay. So IEC has defined, categorized all these issues under the conducted low frequency phenomenon. Conducted because they need a conducting medium, a conductor or a cable. The second one is radiated low frequency phenomenon. So in radiation, there is no conducting medium. The air itself for, for, makes up for the medium. So the signals are radiated. Like for example, your wireless transmission, it is radiated. There's no conducting medium there. Whereas if you have a typical telephone wire, it is conducted. It's a conducted medium. My mobile is not conducted. Clear? They're all radiated. So radi radiated low frequency phenomenon can be because of the presence of magnetic fields and electric fields. Then you have conducted high frequency phenomenon because of induced continuous wave voltages or currents. Due to some reason, they are induced very, very high frequency. Unidirectional transients. A transient, we all know from circuit theory, is a signal which dies down. So in network theory, you have studied the transient response and the steady state response. So what happens in the transients? The response falls and it reaches a steady state. The response falls and reaches a steady state. So unidirectional transients are normally because of lightning. Okay, lightning strikes, there is a sudden increase in the current and then it will die down. Oscillatory transients, so you'll have had go up and down and it will die down after some time. So oscillatory transient will have both positive polarity and negative polarity. And it's called a transient because it dies down, because it dies down. Then you have radiated high frequency phenomenon, again, because of electric fields, magnetic fields, and then electromagnetic fields combination that is presence of both. And then some transients also could be radiated. Then you have electrostatic discharge phenomenon. The static charges are discharged. There is a charge accumulation, maybe because of weather conditions, and then they get discharged. That also comes under the electromagnetic disturbances as defined by IEC. Then you have nuclear electromagnetic pulse. It's called as NEMP, nuclear electromagnetic pulse. So these are all the different classes as described by IEC. Now, when I'm talking of a disturbance, I have to look for some parameters like some attribute. 
So I'm talking of here voltage and current, primarily voltage and current. So I have, I have to talk of some attribute. What is the attribute which I look at and I say it has deviated, deviated from the nominal. So these are some of the aspects, frequency. So what is the frequency? Is it nominal frequency or not? So frequency is obviously one of the prime attributes that we are going to look at. Amplitude or magnitude, because we are talking of sinusoidal signals. What is the amplitude or the magnitude? Now, when you talk of magnitude, you can look at the attribute from an RMS value perspective or from the peak value. Okay, so you are looking at the amplitude. Spectrum. What is the frequency range contained in the signal? What is the frequency range contained in the signal? Modulation. So somewhere in communications, maybe even in your first year basic electronic, you have studied about modulating a signal. So what sort of modulation is used? What is the frequency of the modulating signal? Source impedance. Source impedances drastically affect the voltage at the receiving end. So the receiving end voltage will be the sending end voltage minus the impedance drop, drop across the impedance. So higher the source impedance, lesser will be the receiving end voltage. So what is the source impedance? This is another attribute uh, we look at. Notch. So in English, a notch means a hole, something like a hole. So I have shown a figure here. So this is a notch. Right? This is a notch. So what is a notch depth? And what is the notch area? So these notches occur typically because of triggering the power electronic devices. Because of triggering the power electronic devices. You can't, uh, you can't avoid it. So whenever there is a transition from one switch to the other, a commutation occurring, one, one switch turns on and another switch turns off, that time these notches occur. So this is another attribute we look at. What is the notch depth? What is the notch area? So all these attributes will be used to define different power quality problems. Now there are some non-steady state phenomenon. That means which are like frequency could be a steady state phenomenon. Notch depth, if you look at my previous slide, okay, this is, this is occurring continuously, spectrum and on. But there are some non-steady state. What is the rate of rise? dV by dt or di by dt. Electronic equipment are sensitive not only to voltages, but also to the rate of change of the voltage. What is the amplitude of this non-steady state phenomenon, transient phenomenon, which quickly dies down? How much has it risen? Is it five per unit, six per unit, 10 per unit? What's the duration? Does it loss for 10 microseconds, three milliseconds, two milliseconds? Should I bother about it? Because you know, in a 50 Hertz cycle, in a 50 Hertz signal, one cycle is 20 milliseconds. So supposing now a phenomenon lasts for less than five milliseconds, should I give importance to it? So what is the duration? What is the spectrum? What is the frequency of these transients which may die? Rate of occurrence, how often does it occur? How often does it occur? What is the energy in it? It's not just the amplitude. How much of energy is contained in it? And is the source impedance steady state or is it changing because of some network configuration, network switching, etc.? So these are all some other attributes which are uh, taken into consideration when we define different power quality problems. So these were all classes. Okay, now we will see some categories. Those are classes. So broad class, low frequency, high frequency, radiation, conduction, and so on. Under these, we will see what are the different categories. And approximately what is the common time frame, typical duration of these disturbances. So the first one is transients. So you have impulsive. Impulse means only in one direction. It could be positive or negative. Tip 
typically caused by lightning. It could be in nanoseconds rise, microsecond or millisecond. So you see the order is changing. 10 to the power of minus 9, 10 to the power of minus 6 and 10 to the power of minus 3 seconds. So if it is in nanoseconds, typically the duration is less than 50 nanoseconds. So unless the energy in the transient is high to cause damage, you can neglect it. Right, because it's very short. 50 nanoseconds is very, very short duration. But if the energy is high, this duration is enough, sufficient to cause damage. But if energy is small, you can neglect it. Then I have between 50 nanoseconds to 1 millisecond and greater than 1 millisecond. Then we have oscillatory transients. Oscillatory means it will have both positive polarity and negative polarity. Clear? So we have low frequency where the frequency of oscillation is less than 5 kilohertz. We will see why these transients occur, okay? Uh, I don't want to reveal the secret right now. So the typical duration is around 0.3 to 50 milliseconds. So about uh, approximately two and a half cycles in a 50 hertz uh, fundamental. Medium frequency, is around 5 to 500 kilohertz. These die down very quickly, only 20 microseconds. And very high frequency in the range of megahertz, they hardly last for around 5 microseconds. And uh, these oscillatory voltages typically reach up to 4, 4 to 5 per unit. These are only approximate okay, indicative values, not exact values. Then we have short duration variations. So the short, the word short duration itself uh, implies what it is. So you have instantaneous interruption. Interruption means where the voltage falls very low. You see, the voltage falls below 0.1 per unit, very low, below 10%. It's as good as having zero. Most of your equipment, uh, they don't even, uh, they see it as an interruption. So this lasts for less than one minute. So 30 cycles, so in 60 hertz, these are all, uh, you know, 60 hertz means it will be less than uh, a minute, around one minute. So in SAG, the voltage is typically between 90 to 10 percent of the nominal, so 0.1 to 0.9 per unit. And all these are lasting for 30 cycles, that is one minute. Okay. Uh, then swell and uh, you have, uh, sorry, not one minute, less than a second because one second is uh, 50 cycles. So many cycles per second. So 30 cycles is less than 50 cycles on a 50 hertz uh, fundamental. So they all last for less than one second. I, sorry, I, I told a minute, it is less than one second. That's why it's called instantaneous. It just lasts for one second, instantaneous. Next, we have momentary. Same thing, swell is increase. So it's an increase from 110% to 180%. So in that voltage range, we call it as a swell. And instantaneous sag, swell, or interruption lasts for less than a second. Sometimes you see your, power, your uh, laptop will suddenly restart in a very short, so that could be because of some instantaneous uh, change in the voltage. Then we have momentary changes, same thing. Interruption, sag, swell mean the same, but the duration in momentary is slightly higher. It is up to three seconds. So from about half a second, we are going up to three seconds. Next, we have temporary interruption, sag and swell. So here it lasts up to a minute up to one minute, clear? So these are all called as short duration variations. So if you look at it, maximum it can last is up to one minute. It can be even lesser. This is the second category. The third category is long duration. Interruption is same as before, where the voltage falls below 10%, which is equivalent to zero, but it lasts for greater than one minute. 
if it lasts for less than one minute i can classify it as a instant as an instantaneous interruption or a momentary interruption or a temporary interruption but if it lasts for more than one minute i call it as a long interruption or a sustained interruption under voltage is like sand the voltage is between you know uh, our in a sag it can go up to 10% so in under voltages under voltage it goes between 80 to 90% but lasts for more than 1 minute lasts for more than 1 minute so all likelihood that your equipment may get damaged under under voltage over voltage again you can have up to a 20% rise in the voltage for greater than a minute voltage unbalance can occur in steady state can occur in steady state then we have waveform distortion when you talk of distortion i mean it is not purely sinusoid so in a pure sinusoid my positive and negative half cycles are symmetrical in a pure sinusoid my positive and negative half cycles are symmetrical so my average is zero. In any pure sinusoid, the average is zero. If I have a DC offset, then my average will not be zero. It's as if you're shifting the wave up or down. Okay. Then we have, so that, that causes a distortion because it's no longer sinusoid. So when you use the word waveform distortion, you mean that your signal voltage or current is not sinusoidal, is not sinusoidal. Here. Next, I have harmonics. We have already discussed harmonics. Up to around 20% of the fundamental, you can have harmonics. More than that, it's not good. So we have something called as THD. Total harmonic distortion should be around 20%. Interharmonics, notching, we saw all this. Noise, all these cause waveform distortion. Notches also you saw. It corrupts. You don't get a pure sinusoid because of the notches. Then we have voltage fluctuations that is flicker, rapid. It can occur on and off any times the equipment, welding equipment is on. So that's why it's intermittent. And uh, then you can have power frequency variations. They last less than 10 seconds because as I told you, you have the reason for the power frequency variation is the difference non-matching of the generation and the demand. I can't let it run for a long time like that. Immediately, the load frequency controllers will come into action and they will rectify it. So they last for less than 10 seconds. Now, we'll see what are transients. That part of the change in a variable that disappears during transition from one steady state to another steady state is called as a transition, transient. It dies by itself. A transient dies by itself. The problem is they die by themselves, but they will have very high magnitudes and hence can involve a lot of destruction. The characteristic of a transient is a high magnitude. It can have a high magnitude of voltage, current, or both. Sometimes it may reach thousands of amperes or volts, even in very low voltage systems. But they exist for a very short duration of between 50 to nanoseconds to 50 milliseconds. But the problem is the voltage is very high, so the energy content will be very high. The energy content will be very high. The transients are the shortest duration, shortest duration, because they are only in nanoseconds. Okay. But the frequency can reach as high as, high as 5 megahertz. 5 megahertz. Clear? So the characteristic feature of the transient is it lasts for a short duration between 50 nanoseconds to 50 milliseconds, but it can reach very high magnitudes and very high frequency of up to 5 megahertz. Okay. And uh, some people earlier, they used to also call it a surge, but surge is misleading because many other things also surge is loosely used. So we stick to transients. 
So according to IEEE 100, they define the surge as a transient wave of voltage, current, or power in an electric circuit. But transient is now the more popular popularly used uh, term. So you have two types of transients. The first type is called as the impulsive transient. We know from signals, an impulse is a pulse of a very short duration. It's a sudden non-power frequency change in the steady state condition of voltage, current, or both that is unidirectional in polarity. That's why it is impulsive. It is either only a positive or it is negative, primarily positive or primarily negative. So how do I characterize? I told you I have to measure. So it just lasts for a short time and it falls. So there, what is very important is the rate of rise and rate of fall or rate of decay because it's an impulse. How quickly does the voltage rise? And how quickly does it fall? In essence, the dV by dt or di by dt attribute is very important to characterize an impulsive transient. So if a 1.2 microsecond or I can have 50 microseconds, 2000 volt impulsive transient. So it nominally reaches from its zero to peak value of 2000 volts in 1.2 microseconds and then decays to half its value in 50 microseconds. So this is how we specify the transient. The rise time, the fall time to 50%, and the peak. Clear? So 1.2 microseconds is the time taken for the voltage to reach its peak value of 2,000 volts. And after it reaches the peak value in 50 microseconds, it decays to 50% of it. That means at 2,000 volts. So that is how you characterize an impulsive transient. So the most common cause of impulsive transient is lightning. Most common is lightning. So lightning tra impulsive transients are not usually transmitted far away from where they occur because they die down quickly. No? They die down very quickly. So they do not spread out. So if a lightning strikes, the maximum impact is the place where it has struck. And just to nearby areas, the impact may be felt. But it won't be felt around 10 kilometers or 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers away. But other disturbances may travel clear. Yeah. So this is another very important characteristic of the impulsive transients. They are not transmitted very far away from their place of origin. And they may have different characteristics when you view from different parts of the system because of the impedances which are seen by the part of the network. Okay. So these are quickly damped in the resistance of the network. And we already saw in the classification, impulsive transients. I have in nanosecond range and uh, microsecond and millisecond. So quickly they die down, right? Typically, this is how it looks. So I've shown a negative polarity impulse. You can have a positive polarity impulse. And one thing you have to realize in a three phase system, the impulse impact is not the same in all the three phases. One phase may have a negative uh, polarity uh, impulse and the other phases may have a positive polarity impulse. So the lightning effect will not be the same in all the three phases, in all the three phases, clear? So to summarize, impulsive transients have very high magnitude. They last for a very short time. They are characterized by rise time, fall time, and the peak, peak value. And they do not spread very far away from the place of occurrence. So these are all the main features of an impulsive transient. Next, we have oscillatory transients. So these are described as sudden non-power frequency change in the steady state of, of the voltage or current, but they have both positive and negative. They oscillate. 
they have so partly it is positive negative so you have to describe it by a frequency what is this frequency of oscillation there in impulsive we were interested in the rate of rise and rate of fall here we are interested in the oscillations frequency so based on the frequency we classify them into characterize them into low frequency where the frequency is less than 5 uh, kilohertz so low frequency last for a longer time medium frequency and high frequency so it is characterized by the spectral content that means the frequencies in the transient whereas the impulsive transients is characterized by the rate of change okay and if you see the magnitudes here also are pretty high but high frequency signals die down very quickly and it's the low frequency oscillatory transients which cause a problem so like this you see it goes on okay now the low frequency oscillatory transient it is encountered on sub transmission and distribution systems 132 kv 66 kv 33 kv and so on and it is primarily due to energizing the capacitor so we all know from network theory that whenever you know we know the response of an rlc circuit and uh, we have studied all that so you, you know because of underdamping there will be lot of oscillations before the steady state is reached whenever the capacitor is energized you already have the line resistance and reactance so you have an r and l and when you energize a capacitor you get an rlc circuit so you get a second order circuit and a second order rlc circuit you know can cause oscillations can cause oscillations because of the underdamping so the low frequency oscillatory transients are primarily due to capacitor bank energization so why are why are we having capacitor banks we put capacitor banks to improve power factor you would have studied that in your cores in tnd also in your generation so these capacitor banks are there and i may not put it on all the time so remember capacitor banks are turned on whenever the voltage falls that is when the system is loaded so when the load increases the current increases obviously the voltage will drop and under such conditions i switch on the capacitors however maybe during late night and early morning when the load is less if you keep these capacitors on the voltage will go up because there is no compensation the loads predominantly draw inductive current and these capacitors will draw capacitive current and so the voltage will improve but when the load is low that you may be overcompensating and the voltages will rise so in such cases capacitors are switched off and sometimes reactors are turned on so in the system operation we do turn on and off the capacitors we do turn on and off the capacitors so this capacitor energization causes the low frequency transients okay so the frequency could be anything between 300 to 900 hertz that's why we uh, in the definition we say said it is about, about 1 kilohertz and uh, the values may go up to 2 per unit and may last up to 3 to 5 cycles so oscillatory transients with fundamental frequencies less than 300 hertz are observed due to transformer energization that is i turn on a transformer because of a phenomenon called as ferro resonance ferro resonance so the inrush current of the transformer may lead that that will have some harmonic content and it will lead to a kind of resonance which again cause can cause low frequency transients then you have a medium frequency oscillatory transients which typically happens when you have a back to back capacitor switching that means in a station i may have two capacitor banks i switch on one and then switch on another okay so when a capacitor bank is switched in close proximity to another capacitor that is already energized then what happens the energized capacitor will see energized capacitor already has a transient of around 300 uh, between 300 to 900 hertz okay and what is the reactance of a capacitor 1 by c omega so the capacitor which is energized will see this new capacitor as a low impedance path 
because this energized capacitor is undergoing a transition period where the frequency is around one kilohertz okay and the new capacitor will offer impedance of one by c omega where omega is one kilohertz that will be low impedance and this can give rise to a medium transient and sometimes you can even have an impulsive transient superimposed clear so while a single capacitor bank energizing causes low frequency oscillation a back to back capacitor switching can cause a medium frequency oscillations high frequency oscillations are normally because of power electronic component switching and sometimes because of line transmission line or cable energizing right so these are very local these are a local phenomena and they die down very quickly high frequency transients die down very quickly now see here i put put a um, figure of lightning if you see here here the impulse is negative and uh, here it is positive and you can see the voltage magnitudes they go up to 1.6 per unit 1.26 one point the voltage magnitudes are also different okay so the impact of the lightning is not symmetrical in all the three phases and we'll see some more things now you see here this is a voltage and current waveform when you switch on a monitor so you just see a, a sudden spike in the current the computer monitor so this is an impulsive transient impulsive transient that's when also it can occur though it's not as high as when you have a lightning but still this is the thing and uh, you see here this is when i switch on the cpu again i have an impulse okay and this is when you switch on a laser printer so these are all sudden and then they reach steady state then they reach steady state and this is typically a waveform when you uh, energize a capacitor so you see here this is the load current and this is the load voltage you have high frequency oscillations and then it will reach steady state okay so um in this lecture uh, we covered the different classes the different categories and basically we saw what is the transient power quality disturbance so the transient disturbance is impulsive and primary reason for impulsive trans transients are lightning and they do not have an equal effect on all the three phases and a lot of electronic device switching also can cause impulses like your cpu monitor laser printers and so on and oscillatory transients are predominantly because of capacitor switching so in the next lecture we will see the further uh, power quality disturbances